Well, hello everybody, and it's Patricia Warby here from Alchemy Therapies and my emotional audit uh, and all the other things that I'm involved with. Uh, books, I've got seven. I've got seven books out. I've got various courses. My arena today is going to be talking about anxiety because that's kind of what I specialize in, having suffered from it myself over the years. Um, and I specifically look at why anxiety springs up as a result of past experience, or some call this childhood trauma. But I think trauma can be a bit of a misleading word because it implies that uh, you've had something absolutely tragic happen to you. In the, in the minds of most people, trauma is, is you know, uh, the death of, of somebody or a, a severe accident or being taken hostage or, you know, those kinds of things. And actually trauma is a very everyday experience. It can be the way you were born. It can be uh, a separation that you had when you were young. It can be an operation you had that you haven't fully dealt with. Um, and so I... I find that anxiety is the most common symptom for people who've had these experiences that haven't been resolved. Okay, so um, I was kind of interested to, to deal with this today because I read a blog by uh, a colleague of mine, um, Carolyn Spring, who does a lot of training uh, for psychotherapists, um, holistic therapists, anybody who deals with people in, in post-trauma kind of work. Um, she herself has had childhood trauma of a quite severe kind, um, abuse trauma, uh, at, which caused her to become highly dissociated. But not everybody has those terrible experiences. They may have these more general experiences, but it doesn't matter. As far as the body is concerned, accumulative relational trauma, such as, you know, not being understood or seen or heard in your family or being belittled or humiliated because you were different or um, feeling like you were too sensitive compared to everybody else and judging yourself and having other people judge you. Um, and I think it's really important, therefore, to understand that, that these little things, these drip feeds can create the same symptoms as a full-blown uh, trauma of, of some terrible event or series of events. So I'm going to sort of cover a little bit of what she has talked about in her blog, and I'll put the link to the blog beneath, um, because I think it's a very, very well written blog. And it's such a beautiful example of why we treat anxiety completely wrongly. Um, number one, uh, her point is understand that anxiety is trying to keep us safe. All right. So anxiety is your amygdala and a few other parts of your brain in your limbic system firing to tell you something's wrong, something's wrong. And when we tend to get, you know, butterflies in, in the tummy and we'll get um, maybe <gasps> shallow breathing, which doesn't help because that reduces oxygen and increases carbon dioxide in our blood, which is another stimulus. Um, or we, we might simply just feel uh, very deflated, very just out of sorts you know just don't feel right and that that tended to be how I felt I, I wasn't aware of anything in particular that was causing the anxiety I just had a feeling that something was wrong and it would often be worse in the morning which it often is um, basically anxiety is there to teach us to focus on what the problem is but in today's society it's very difficult where we are, we're lonely and we're isolated and we're told that we have a mental health issue and um, sometimes we're medicated for that, particularly if we're young, we, we don't see it as a, as a symptom of what's underneath, of, of something that hasn't been resolved for us emotionally. Um, and so actually anxiety is, is reasonable, it's natural, it's normal. It's just trying to draw your attention. But the problem is, we first of all we panic about the feeling so we add anxiety about anxiety it's sort of like meta anxiety um and then we also make sort of judgments or thoughts around the anxiety that you know why can't i sort this get a grip you know um and, and you don't understand what's going on so she's talking about the alarm signal being where you switch off one circuit which says I'm okay I'm safe which is your ventral vagal and you go into fight and flight which is your sympathetic activation which is spinal cord nerves and they're trying to fire you to action to run to fight or flight you know um, and so 
you, the worst thing you can do is suppress that and try and pretend it's not there or tell yourself off for having it because that only builds the anxiety. Um, you see, safety is, is being part of something. It's belonging. It's having connection to others who care about you unconditionally. And if you didn't grow up with that for whatever reason, or it was sporadic, or there were things that got in the way, we're not saying parents didn't love you. They did their best. And we're not saying it's all the parents' fault because often it's a transgenerational trauma, but maybe they found you difficult to understand or they were messed up in their own lives and so couldn't give you what you needed. There's all sorts of reasons why you might you might feel that. So anxiety is, is a back brain phenomenon, okay? Your limbic brain lies beneath your cortex. It's nothing about thinking, it's not. It gets overlaid with thinking when, as I've said, you start to worry about your symptoms. Um, and it's basically a, a symptom or a fingerprint of trauma that hasn't been resolved in your, your history. I right know for me, it was the death of my dad when I was 18 and uh, just head, heading off to uni, I'd just arrived, in fact, when he died and um, it it was such a shock to the system I couldn't actually process it at that time and I had to kind of dissociate to deal with it and just carry on as if nothing had happened and not tell anybody I couldn't tell anyone because I didn't know anybody yet and and so I had no good friends to support me through that and that was partly the issue because I'd, I'd moved away from everyone I knew. Um, so you have to find whatever it is that's underlying that. And it may be that, first of all, you can't find that and you, you just need to deal with the symptom itself. And so building a better relationship with anxiety and saying, ah, okay, I don't feel safe. I wonder why that is. Now, for me, my anxiety was triggered later in life when uh, my relationship broke down. I've talked about this before, but I haven't talked about what happened afterwards was that I went into, uh, well, first of all, I went into a lodging um, one room basically in someone else's house which should have been a bolt hole which it was for about three weeks um, and then I started to feel increasingly uncomfortable because I really wasn't wanted there I was only helping to pay the mortgage um, and then after that once I realized actually this isn't going to work for me I found a shared house which I moved into uh, but it was it was completely chaotic and I was 35 I think um, and I was sort of having to return to student digs, if, if you like, which is great when you're like 20, 22. But at 34, 35, it feels like a downgrade from what you've known, which is, you know, your homeowner, you have status and all of that. And so it was a really, really difficult time in my life. Um, and I think what, what really triggered it at, at some point was that the people uh, whose house I was in, um, because it wasn't an equal shared house, it was, it was the, the two owners lived there, um, was they wanted to bring another person in because they had, they had four rooms. And I was not given any choice in who they brought in, of course, because it was their house and entirely up to them. Uh, and then they went away. And they went away and brought someone in and who I didn't know, who I was sharing a house with, a male. And as much as you want to trust a person to be fine that's that's your home that's your sanctuary and I just couldn't cope with it my front brain said come on get a grip it's fine my back brain said danger 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 get out of here and I actually had physical symptoms of collapse and I I had to get someone to drive me uh, from that place to my mum's and had to go and sort of uh, shelter with my mum for a while which was so shameful to say, I, I'm not actually coping, I wasn't sleeping, you know, when you're not sleeping, that really adds to the symptomology because that in itself triggers the feelings of anxiety. All right, so you have to know what's going on and you have to say, there's something in my environment that doesn't feel safe. How could I make my environment, my environment more safe? And there are various things you can do. You can reach out to people, um, you can, uh, plan your day much more clearly, you know, limit your time in places that don't feel good to you and with people that drain you. Uh, you the worst response is, is to try and muffle it and say, you know, it's, it, it shouldn't be here, you know. Um, if you can't get to safety, you have to soothe the fact that you will, you will soon get to safety, you know, I'll be home soon. Um, 
I am safe. My body is just remembering times when I wasn't, you know, and, and I teach something called havening, which is really good for that. Um, so none of this is your body failing, all right? Your body's actually doing what it's designed to do, but in relational safety. And the problem is we don't live in relational safety. Most of us don't anymore. Um, we live in stressful situations, perhaps as a young person, you know, we're being compared to others. School is much more competitive these days. Your grades have to be good. You, you, you're all forced pretty much to think about university, even if you don't want to. Um, it, it's just a really difficult environment. And for uh, sort of young adults, it's, it's the competition doesn't end there. You know, now you've got to find somehow enough money to, to buy it or, or consider renting, which is really expensive and there's no security in work anymore. You know, there's no jobs for life, really. And so as you then contemplate maybe settling down, having a relationship, there's more stress, you know, finding the right person to be compatible with all the ups and downs of relationships. There's so much going on that's going to trigger your sense of this is this is difficult. This is dangerous. So you have to be aware that um, anxiety is just kind of triggered all the time in daily life. I think even as a middle-aged person or midlife, as, as I prefer to call it, um, you've got lots of things going on. You've got the fear of, of loss of relatives, you know, uh, parents um, gradually getting old, you know, how to deal with that. If they're going to um, lose their cognition, you know, get dementia, or are they going to need care or are they and eventually they're going to die and you're going to lose them and so that's a massive stress and also you're dealing with uh, younger members of your family and and trying to you know make sure your kids are okay and it's it's very very hard to find a stress-free environment in our lives at the moment so um so as a summary then acknowledging that, that you're anxious first of all you're feeling it and it's okay but making the link that anxiety is a signal that you're unsafe and trying to mitigate that make it less and and one of the ways you can do that um you can either soothe through i i use havening which is, which is a touch-based system or the breath slowing down the breath and it doesn't work for everybody some people find the breath really triggering but if you can slow your breathing and get into your belly for me what worked um weirdly was computer games um was just playing and my brain would switch off and get into focusing on what was happening. And I'm sure it's a form of numbing. And I wouldn't suggest for it, for any um, anyone that that's, that's a long-term solution. But at least it would shut it down for a short while. And I'd come away feeling a little bit more regulated. Because what's happening is your nervous system is dysregulated at this point. Um, so collaborate with your bodies. I love that. Um, she's saying um, you need to deal with some of the physical aspects of anxiety. So getting good sleep if you can, now that's difficult if you're feeling anxious, uh, but not looking at screens late into the night, that really doesn't help. Um, and, and kind of just soothing yourself before you go to bed in whatever way you need to, plumping your pillows, making sure you're warm enough um, and, and just telling yourself, it's okay, it's okay, I'm safe here and this is now. Making sure you're eating well. Uh, so many people are eating these ultra processed foods and particularly young people who live about 80, 90 percent on, on ultra processed foods if if they don't get cooked for. Uh, so, you know, those things are ultimately inflammatory and they're inflammatory in the brain as well as the body. Uh, the two are very, very linked. Um, making sure you're not hyper stimulated, making sure you move your bodies all very, very important. Um, walking, you know, is important. And that's certainly something I've noticed recently that definitely calms my body down, just going out for a walk in nature. Um, uh, obviously, substances, avoiding, if you can, the, the self-medication, you know, drinking, taking any form of recreational drugs. And lastly, avoidance, you know, just being aware that this is happening and allowing that rather than fighting it. Cognitive reframe. Now this is straight from cognitive behavioral therapy and this is to avoid being anxious about being anxious, all right? So not making it bigger than what it is and trying to allow it to be there without wanting to eradicate it, <clears throat> squash it, pretend it's not there. 
no anxiety disappears because you will it to be so right you actually have to make friends with it in a way which is a really strange thing to say I know but you have to say okay you're here you're trying to tell me something I'm listening and what is it about my environment that's triggered me to feel unsafe and then maybe you can identify that um so seeing anxiety as normal natural and useful seeing it as a message and not who you are so <clears throat> the way modern medicine deals with it it says you're anxious so you are suffering anxiety and what happens in our brains when we hear that is we're mentally ill and we are anxious rather than seeing it as something we're doing or expressing we see it as who we are uh, and that is a problem because it starts to blur the the distinction between the condition or the behavior and the person we really are underneath, which is just we're highly sensitive, most of us. We take things in, we process them differently. Anxiety, therefore, is a notification. It's, it's just saying, I'm here, you know, pay attention. And if you can stop and just allow it to be there and stop fighting it, it often decreases because it's being recognized and that's what the back brain wants more than anything is is connection connection with your body um and not seeing it as an illness but seeing it as a lack of skills right and i think this was the most important point i i got from her blog uh, which is so true you lack the skills you lack the ability to self-soothe and you can learn how to self-soothe all right you you're not broken you are not you know defective this is just something you never learn how to do for whatever reason and it's not something you need to recover from as such you just need to know what to do when you're feeling like this it's a skill set and you can manage it and eventually the anxiety does go away folks it doesn't last forever when you know how to deal with it and then you need to find some techniques which i teach um, come on one of my monthly group calls and you will learn how to do havening. Um, it's just such a simple process. It doesn't require any, any cost. It's free. It uses your own hands. Uh, it's a self-soothing technique and it's really, really good. And it's brilliant when done relationally with another person or a group of people. Um, it's all online. You don't have to be uh, visible on camera if you don't want to be. You can just listen in and take part. Um, and so being, being aware that focus is really important. What you focus on tends to build that. All right. So if you focus on it being a disease or being an illness or being that you're sick and, and broken, the body kind of and the brain have to fire up that's another stressful situation and it will think right there's another threat here we're broken we're bad and so um then getting help i think is the really important thing is reaching out and saying which is what i had to do i can't do this on my own i need i need support from people who understand just someone to sit with you not try and fix you or suppress you but just say ah oh, this is what's going on and you will recover you will you will overcome this when you learn how to self-soothe and so thank you carolyn for that really wonderful blog I, I read that yesterday and i really wanted to comment on it because um carolyn's training is is amazing as well if you're a professional um she's really in depth really spot on her her own experience largely has influenced what she does that's uh, carolynspring.com. Uh, but also, I've developed some courses, and you can find those on my website, alchemytherapies.co.uk. If you go up to the top, you'll see all the links, um, my podcast, my YouTube, my blog, and my courses are all linked in there. Um, and basically, you can learn everything around adverse childhood experience, because that's what we call these past experiences that are not over as far as your body's concerned. And they are the things that are triggering the anxiety. And then current events in your life uh, is reminding your body of that and bringing up the symptom. And so if you resolve the past events as over, then the present has more resilience in it. 
right? Most of the people I meet have very little extra resilience and the least little thing is going to tip them into anxiety. But if we can increase the gap between your stress level now and the stress level that tips you into anxiety, then you've got more, you've got more play in the system. All right. So dealing with the past is really important, but you're going to need help for that. You can't deal with that on your own because you're trying to change the brain that's dysregulated uh, with a dysregulated brain, which is almost impossible. You need someone that you can lean into, somebody who can hold the space for you, who feels safe to you. Now, the way I work is I always ask for people to come for the discovery call. Now, I know that's a really common thing. You'll probably see uh, there's an advert running at the moment on YouTube about do you not have time for discovery calls by a woman with really wild eyes? I mean, she's scary. Um, uh, <laughs> but I do the discovery call uh, because I need to just tune into that person and notice if their body feels safe with me. So it's an absolutely vital part of what I do before I work with anyone. And of course, for that, for the person themselves, they need to feel safe with me. They need to notice whether um, their body reacts well to me. So that's how I work. I, go, I do a discovery call, then we'll do an initial consultation, and then I'll take you through uh, six to 12 sessions. It varies, it depends, of re-regulation, regulating your body uh, to feel safe again. And the results are remarkable um, compared to cognitive behavioral therapy or talk therapy that can take years of weekly sessions. Um, this is remarkably efficient because it's talking to the part of your brain that's actually creating these symptoms, your back brain. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, do get in touch. Um, otherwise, uh, enjoy your day and please, please take care of yourselves. All right. Bye for now. Bye bye.